Open reduction and internal fixation of displaced medial epicondyl fracture using a screw and washer. This video was produced based on the book source cited below. Henricus W. N.D. Section 2. In M.S. Cocker, ed., Operative Techniques in Pediatric Orthopedic Surgery. Pitfalls. Simple avulsion fractures, minimally displaced, can be treated non-operatively. If the AP radiograph demonstrates a minimally displaced fracture and the lateral radiograph does not demonstrate a fat pad sign, then a simple avulsion fracture, figure 1, has occurred rather than a fracture associated with an elbow dislocation or subluxation. Controversies. Some authors advocate non-operative treatment for all medial epicondyl fractures. Non-controversies operative treatment usually leads to a non-union. In the non-athlete, the non-union is rarely symptomatic. However, in athletes who are involved in overhead activities, the non-union can result in valgus instability of the elbow and limit the athlete's performance. Controversies. Some authors suggest that opening of the medial joint by the valgus stress test is an indication for open reduction and internal fixation. Other authors discount this test and state that all patients with significant displacement of the epicondyl will demonstrate a positive valgus stress test. Instead, the decision to operate should be based on the patient's need to have a stable elbow for his or her sport or work. Some authors suggest that opening of the medial joint by the valgus stress test is an indication for open reduction and internal fixation. Other authors discount this test and state that all patients with significant displacement of the epicondyl will demonstrate a positive valgus stress test. Instead, the decision to operate should be based on the patient's need to have a stable elbow for his or her sport or work. Indications An acute, displaced medial epicondyl fracture associated with an elbow dislocation or subluxation in an adolescent athlete. The skin is examined for abrasions or open injuries. The sensory and motor function of the ulnar nerve, the radial pulse, and capillary refill of the hand are evaluated. The wrist and shoulder are also examined for possible additional injuries. Plain radiographs should be obtained in ontero posterior, AP, lateral, and valgus stress views. The AP radiograph is best for determining the amount of displacement of the medial epicondyl fracture, figure. The lateral radiograph is examined to be certain that the elbow joint is reduced and that the medial epicondyl fragment is not in the joint, figure. The valgus stress view can be utilized to demonstrate valgus instability of the elbow. This can be done prior to surgery with a gravity valgus stress test, or under anesthesia prior to making the skin incision. The lateral radiograph is examined to be certain that the elbow joint is reduced and that the medial epicondyl fragment is not in the joint. The valgus stress view, figure, can be utilized to demonstrate valgus instability of the elbow. This can be done prior to surgery with a gravity valgus stress test, or under anesthesia prior to making the skin incision. Non-operative treatment is acceptable for some non-athletes. For these patients, treatment can include a brief period of splinting followed by range of motion exercises. Prolonged casting is not recommended. Many medial epicondyl fractures occur with an elbow dislocation or subluxation. Casting may lead to permanent elbow stiffness. Other techniques for fixation exist for operative treatment, such as a Kirshner wire, K-wire, rather than a screw and washer. However, the K-wire does not produce compression of the fracture. In addition, the less rigid and often prominent K-wire can inhibit the ability of the athlete to perform early motion. Early motion is necessary to prevent permanent elbow stiffness. Pearls. A sterile tourniquet is applied after prepping and draping the patient. The use of the sterile tourniquet allows more room for the surgical incision. Equipment See arm fluoroscope. Plexiglass radio loosened upper extremity table. This can be as simple as a 3 foot times 5 foot times 1 2 inch piece of plexiglass placed under the patient's shoulders and trunk and extending out about 3 feet on the side of the injury. Sterile tourniquet instrumentation. A small self-retaining retractor can be utilized to spread the skin. 
A skin hook is used to retract the medial epicondyl distally to expose the bed in which the fragment originated. Pearls. On terra posterior and lateral fluoroscopy is needed to be certain the drill passes into the center of the medial column of the distal humerus, avoiding the olecranon fossa. Instrumentation implantation. Small fragment screw set. 2.5 mm drill bit. Power drill. Soft tissue guide. Surgical anatomy. The medial epicondyl is the last growth plate to fuse in the elbow. Figure. Fusion occurs between the ages of 14 and 18. Fusion occurs later in males. The ulnar collateral ligament originates on the inferior surface of the medial epicondyl. Muscles in the flexor pronator mass, including the pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor digitorum superficialis, and flexor carpi ulnaris, originate from the medial epicondyl. Supine positioning is used, with a plexiglass radiolucent upper extremity table for the injured elbow, figure. The C-arm is brought in under the radiolucent table perpendicular to the patient. The surgeon sits on the ulnar side of the upper extremity table. A sterile tourniquet is utilized on the operative arm. A longitudinal skin incision about 4 cm long is made in the skin centered on the medial epicondyl. In the swollen injured elbow, fluoroscopy can be utilized to mark the site of the medial epicondyl and place the skin incision. The displaced medial epicondyl is identified and reflected distally with a skin hook to expose the origin of the epicondyl fragment and to identify and protect the ulnar nerve inferiorly. Step 1. Following exposure, a 2.5 mm drill bit with soft tissue guide is placed into the center of the site of origin of the medial epicondyl fragment from the medial condyle of the distal humerus. The soft tissue guide is used to prevent inadvertent injury to the adjacent ulnar nerve. Fluoroscopy is used to guide the direction of the drill. N the drill bit is passed up the medial column of the distal humerus, figure. Care is taken to avoid drilling into the olecranon fossa. Pearls. A small curette can be utilized to scrape off any small undersurface cartilage from the medial epicondyl. This step helps to ensure fusion of the epicondyl following screw. A small curette can be utilized to scrape off any small undersurface cartilage from the medial epicondyl. This step helps to ensure fusion of the epicondyl following screw compression. Pitfalls. Be certain to drill the center of the medial epicondyl and the center of the origin of the medial epicondyl on the distal humerus in order to fix the fragment anatomically. Pitfalls. Do not compress the screw too much. A gentle two-finger touch and the use of fluoroscopy can prevent this error. Too much compression can result in fragmentation of the medial epicondyl and loss of fixation. Placing the screw into the olecranon fossa will block elbow motion. Be certain that final fluoroscopic images demonstrate the screw going up the medial column and not into the olecranon fossa. Instrumentation, Implantation A 40 mm long small fragment screw and metal washer. Pitfalls Permanent elbow stiffness may result if the arm is immobilized for more than a week in a splint, cast, or sling. The athlete, parents, and therapists need to understand that motion is lotion for this injury. Step 2. The 2.5 mm drill bit with soft tissue guide is used to drill a hole in the center of the medial epicondyl fragment. This can be done simply by flipping the medial epicondyl over identifying the center of the epicondyl, and drilling from inside out. Step 3. A small fragment screw and metal washer are selected for fixation. The screw is typically about 40 mm long. The screw does not need to reach the far cortex. Tapping is not necessary. The metal washer is utilized to increase the surface area for compression and to prevent the screw head from penetrating or fragmenting the apophyseal epicondyla fragment. N the screw and washer are hand screwed through the medial epicondylar fragment from outside in until the screw tip is protruding about 10 cm through the epicondyl. The tip of the screw is then placed into the pre-drilled hole in the medial condyle. With the elbow flexed to about 90 degrees and the forearm in supination, the screw is slowly hand screwed up the medial column of the distal humerus. 
The epicondylar fragment is gradually compressed back to its origin. Ontero posterior, figure, and lateral, figure, fluoroscopic images are obtained to document repair of the medial epicondyl and appropriate screw and washer position. Controversies. For the typical teenager patient with a large epicondyl fragment, a screw and washer provide rigid fixation that allows for early motion. Prolonged post-fixation casting is not recommended because elbow stiffness may result. However, for the less common case of a small epicondyl fragment in young children, a smaller buried K-wire can be utilized for fixation. In these cases, casting may be needed for two weeks to prevent displacement. Elbow motion should be started after cast removal. A cannulated small fragment screw can also be used for fixation. However, hardware breakage complications may occur when using small cannulated systems. Step 4. The wound is irrigated and the tourniquet is released and removed. All bleeding should be controlled. The subcutaneous tissues are closed using interrupted viral suture. The skin is closed with interrupted monocryl or nylon suture. The arm is placed into a well-padded splint with the elbow at about 80 degrees of flexion and the forearm in supination. Post-operative care and expected outcomes. The splint is removed on post-operative day 3 or 4 and elbow motion is started. Instruction and monitoring of motion, strengthening, and home exercises by a physical therapist is recommended. An athletes should anticipate returning to their pre-injury sport by about 12 weeks post-surgery with a near full range of motion and no valgus instability.